The brain is the most complex object in the known universe. However, recent advances in brain scanning have greatly improved our understanding of how learning happens and how memories are formed. Using diagrams, this short film introduces a jargon-free and accessible way to understand these new insights and so make them useful to teachers. Now, if we take this model here of the brain, we could start to paint on it the jobs which are done in specific areas. So for instance, here I've painted in blue what's called the primary visual cortex. That is, when you see something with your eyes, the information is first transmitted right to the back of the brain here in the primary visual area. The model is really quite complex because some of the parts are hidden inside the folds. So this simplified model has the same parts in the correct position, but without all the folds and difficulties which arise from describing which bit does what. One major input to the brain is, of course, our eyes, vision. The picture initially arrives here, right at the back of the brain, in what's called the primary visual area. The brain analyzes it in the area around the outside, sometimes called the visual association area. And it does two separate jobs. In the, on the left-hand route, uh, we decide what it is that we're seeing. We could say it analyzes the detail. And then on the right, we look at the whole picture. So that, for instance, on the left, we may be able to say that is a glass of juice, that is a banana, that is a man. Um, and on the right, we might be able to say there is a family having a picnic. Looking at the ears or the auditory system, um, we have two areas in the brain for processing sound. Most people process speech on the left, but there are other things happening on the right. Uh, not only is the right-hand side used for music and song, but also for the intonation or rhythm in the voice. So the two sides of the brain are doing different jobs and working together. The next input is known as the sensory cortex, that is where we feel and touch things and have sensitivity to temperature. And this is this green strip, which is like a hairband going across the top of your head here. Uh, all the inputs from your body come to this strip along here and are analysed in the area around it, which I mark green here, sometimes called the association area. So there will be a position here where we are picking up the texture of the surface we're touching, for instance. And we can put these three inputs onto a flat diagram, so we can have vision being received at the back here and analysed around it, and we can have sound being received on both sides of the brain and analysed in two different ways, and the touch and body position along the middle being analysed to this area just behind it. Just in front of the sensory or touch area is what's called the motor cortex. This is a strip of the brain which is rather like a piano keyboard. Every single position represents one tiny muscle in your body. Of course, when you take any action, we don't just use one muscle, we tend to coordinate a group of muscles together. And this is all done in the area in front of it, which we called here the action planning area. There's a second important kind of action which humans do, which is speech. And this has a special area right next to the motor cortex here, generally speaking on the left-hand side of the brain. We can add these two areas to the diagram. So the motor strip and action planning is just in front, and speech is formed here on the left. Another important area is called the visual spatial sketch pad. This is what you might call the mind's eye. Whenever you are closing your eyes and imagining something, or even visualising something with your eyes open, it's taking place here. So we can add the sketch pad to the diagram just here. So now we have a simple diagram showing what the main functional areas of the brain are which are receiving and taking action. So on the diagram of the brain, let's see the parts of the brain which need to be working well to carry out the task of reading something out loud. First of all, we need to see the words in the visual cortex. Then we need to identify the parts of the word or the phonics and then build those into words which we recognise and then build some meaning out of the words. To help us build the meaning, we need to build up some imagery in the sketchpad. 
Now we've just read the words now, now we need to speak them out loud, so we need to use the speech forming area as well. So lots of parts of the brain all working together. If we were to look at the brain under a microscope, we would see that the basic unit is the neuron or nerve cell. This has parts at one end which receive signals from other cells, and then a long bit called an axon, and then bits at the other end which transmit the signal to the next cells along. Of course, they don't look like that simple diagram, they look a bit more like that. This diagram shows three neurons joined together. The connections between the neurons are not electrical, they're chemical, and they use chemicals which are called neurotransmitters. If our brains were wired up from birth, no learning would be possible. The connection is called a synapse, and here is a diagram of it. When we are trying to develop memories, what we are trying to develop are these connections, these synapses. They start off as quite small and not very good connections. As we do the learning, these connections become stronger and we get what you might call permanent memories. This is a picture which illustrates what you might see if you look inside the brain. Each of these represents a brain cell and these are the connections between them. We have about 10 billion of these neurons, or one with 10 noughts on the end. To have some idea about how many 10 billion is, 10 billion is about the number of trees in the whole of the Amazon rainforest. Learning and memories are links. The neuroscientists say that the cells which fire together will wire together. Consequently, when our students are learning, we are physically changing their brains. New connections are being made which may persist for the whole of their lives. The skills needed for thinking, such as paying attention and working memory, these are all functions of what's called the prefrontal cortex. It's the part of the brain at the front. If you were to put your hand over your forehead, it's a bit of the brain that you would be covering if your skull wasn't there. See on this diagram coloured green, and in our two-dimensional diagram, it's the area in front here, the prefrontal cortex. The prefrontal cortex doesn't have its own input, such as, as the visual or auditory area, for instance. Um, it draws in information from other parts of the brain, such as the visual area, auditory, kinesthetic, speech and language areas, and the sketch pad. In order to do its job, it needs to be able to connect with these areas well. The attention skill is the ability to sustain the attention on something by choice and to return there despite distraction. The part of the brain that needs to be in control is called the executive, and so we call attention an executive function. And for this we need to see the brain in a slightly different light, that is, we need to take a vertical cross-section through it. Coming up our spine is the spinal cord, which at the top becomes the brainstem. Around the outside of the brainstem is what's called the limbic system, which is the centre of our emotions. And then the cortex is around the outside of those two layers. And in particular, this is the motor cortex at the top of the picture there. And if we look on the model, this is where the motor cortex is. So this is a vertical section through the brain like this. Let's look at a pupil with reactive mind, with low self-discipline. An emotion comes up in the emotional part of the brain and immediately connects to the motor cortex to take some action. They may say whatever comes into their mind, they may get up and move, they may take something which doesn't belong to them. It's action without thought. Now let's look at a more self-disciplined mind. Again, the emotion is wanting to drive action. However, the executive at the front of the brain here has an alternative path. It can override the emotion so that the reactive response is suppressed and we're now chosen to take the action or not, we would say it was a considered response. So the strength of the executive is connected to the ability to override the emotional response, and this skill is vital for learning, otherwise the pupil will not be able to pay attention in the classroom. 
So now we can add the executive to the diagram. It's right at the front of the brain here, literally just above the eyes. Working memory is the ability to hold information in your mind for a few seconds while you think about it. It's quite separate from what we would call long-term or permanent memories. And there are two types. There's an auditory loop, which you might call the inner voice. That's when you're saying something to yourself without actually saying it out aloud. And the visual or spatial memory, which you might call the mind's eye, when we were imagining something. Let's look at auditory working memory. If these numbers come up for a short period of time, almost all of us can remember that it was 361. But as we increase the number of random numbers, we reach a point where we can't remember them. And that is our working memory capacity. This is the visual spatial aspect of working memory. This is one way in which we could assess it in pupils. We could give them this nine square grid and show them some shapes for a short period of time and see how good they were at writing down the answer. We could start off with a single shape in a single square and increase the number of shapes. And this would give us some measure of the number of visual objects and spatial positioning which the pupil was able to remember. When the tests are done, we find that working memory capacity is around about seven plus or minus two units. That is, it's in the range between five and nine. Working memory is more diffusely positioned in the prefrontal cortex, but it is roughly where you might hold yourself like that. Some areas on the left and some on the right. Let's look at some of the results of limited working memory. Let's say the pupils come in and this student has five slots in their working memory and you give them what seems to be a simple instruction. Collect a pencil and a piece of paper, write the date and the title at the top, open the textbook at page 64 and answer question four. They go into the working memory like this. But unfortunately, before the end, the working memory is already full. And so the final instructions have to override some of the ones which are already there. Consequently, the student doesn't know where to start and says, what are we doing? We can position working memory in our two-dimensional diagram, a bit on the left and a bit on the right. These three diagrams can be used to help explain many of the things we see in classrooms. How learning happens, why some pupils find learning so difficult, and what we can do to improve learning. They have also been used by therapists to help explain worry and rumination, and by meditators to explain why mindfulness is so good at reducing stress and improving attention skills. The ideas in this short introductory clip are developed in a training video by Media Merge, How Brains Learn, and in the parallel ebook by Mike Bell with the same title.